Hello, and welcome to What Comes to Mind, Season 2 of The Psychonaut Show. This is John K. Burton, MD, psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and your host on this podcast that brings ideas from the history of psychoanalysis to solve problems in everyday life. In this episode, we are going to explore projective identification. That sounds like a long academic word about some esoteric psychoanalytic concept. But remember our first episode where I talked about wizards and the magic of psychoanalysis and studying the psyche. Think of projective identification like the words in the Harry Potter spells. Expecto Patronum, Wingardium Leviosa, projective identification, or like the words from a movie that was very important to me as a child, but no one seems to talk about it or even know about it anymore, Bedknobs and Broomsticks. Do you mind if I have a go? Oh, of course not. Now come along, you lot. We need all the help we can get. Draguna, Macrades, Dracorum Satis D. Traguna Macrodius Traguna Satis D. Projective identification is where analysis really feels like magic. Now, projective identification is a little bit complicated. Magic requires some study. But let me just describe it like this. It's when you have a feeling that belongs to someone else, not you. I'll give you an example of something that happened to me a little while ago in my office. So a patient was lying on the couch, and he had been quiet for a very long time. Now, the reason that we use the couch, among other things, is because it's easier to feel free to be quiet, to not feel pressured to speak. But during this moment, I felt obligated to say something or do something, which again is completely against the point of using the couch. And I realized that actually the way I was feeling was the way he felt all the time. One of the problems that he was working on was the feeling that he had of always being pressured or obligated to other people to the point that he didn't even know his own mind. And when I had this feeling and I realized I was actually feeling what he feels, I said this to him and he felt, yes, that is how I feel and I understand. And it's a powerful kind of understanding because it's in that moment. He was able to hear me have his feeling in a way that allowed him to understand his feeling. But this happens all the time between people, not just between therapists and patients. I'll give you another example that actually happened at my gym. A really popular trainer I know, who always seems to be in a good mood, was looking really down and upset. Now this woman has improved the health of many people and is one of the most knowledgeable people herself I know. So. This was leg day for me and I was between squats, so I had some time to talk to her and see what was up. And she told me she had gotten a new client and he had just sent her a text saying he didn't want to work with her anymore because she wasn't giving him what he needed. And she felt like she had really gone above and beyond to help him out. And she said, it's making me feel really inadequate. And this is what happened. After her first appointment with him, he had sent her several texts, which is really being kind of demanding of her time as it's outside of the session and she's not getting paid. But she answered them, keeping on message about the diet and the workout. And then after the second session, he seemed kind of sullen and made none of the changes that she had suggested. She was feeling kind of frustrated, but she kept encouraging him and told him to keep up the good work. And then later, she got a long text saying that he didn't feel like he was being helped and that she was just treating him like a paycheck and that he felt like he needed to work with somebody else. And she felt like she couldn't stop thinking about what she had done wrong. And it was, again, this feeling of inadequacy and also, quite frankly, kind of angry at him. Now, everyone who works in a client-based business, and that is most businesses, honestly, has had the experience of a client that they don't look forward to or even dread seeing. 
And what do you do? What are you supposed to do when you're in that kind of situation? You could fire the client, just not work with them anymore, and that would deprive you of income, and it would possibly hurt your reputation. Or you could keep them and just sort of bear it, and this would be a detriment to your own stress level. But projective identification helps us figure out what is going on emotionally, and this makes our work not only more enjoyable, but it allows us to get along with the person more easily and make us more effective at whatever job we are trying to do. So I want to get a little bit more into the mechanics of projective identification because it is a little bit complicated, as I said, but magic requires study. And I was looking online to see if anyone else had talked about projective identification and tried to apply it to everyday life, and people had. But they kept getting it wrong. For example, I came across one page that talked about an example of Mark calling John fat and John feeling bad about it. But if John actually was fat, it wasn't projective identification. And if he wasn't fat, then it was. And this is totally wrong. It has nothing to do with reality about whether John is fat or not. So let's get into what it really is. Melanie Klein is the first one to describe projective identification. She was the first one to use the term. Now, you remember Melanie Klein as that brilliant woman that we talked about in the last season with the wild ideas. Well, this is one of those wild ideas, but it actually really is useful. She first described it in her 1946 paper, Notes on Some Schizoid Mechanisms, and this is what she said. An unconscious fantasy in which aspects of the self or an internal object are split off and attributed to an external object. So she's describing a fantasy. Now I have to tell you about this idea of internal objects, which comes from the object relations school, which came out of Melanie Klein's work. And they said that the drives and instincts and emotions that Freud talked about are not in a vacuum, but I always containing the idea of another person. So if a baby feels anxiety, he is feeling that anxiety in his idea of another. Usually it's the mother. And when he becomes an adult, the anxious feelings that he might have will always be inextricably linked to that idea of the other person. So a feeling is always connected in the representation of a person an object. So projective identification is a way to get the bad object, the bad feeling, out of oneself and put it into someone else. Melanie Klein called it a fantasy, and that's a fantasy. But here is the magical part. It actually happens, like in the example with my silent patient who was making me feel his feeling. So in order to get into this part this magical part of projective identification where the feeling actually goes into the other person. And I know this sounds kind of like voodoo, but that's what we're talking about. We have to talk about the intersubjectivists. The intersubjectivists came up in the late 70s and early 80s out of the work of Kohut and Winnicott, who we met in previous episodes. And I think of them as if Melanie Klein was the St. Augustine of psychoanalysis, then the intersubjectivists were like Meister Eckhart and Mother Julian. They are the mystics. They say that we do experience emotions always in connection with another person, the idea of another person, but in addition, we can never observe it objectively and completely from outside. We are always participating and creating together. Intersubjectivism comes also out of the ideas of German idealism that is like Kant and Hegel who said we can't know absolute things. We can only know things through our senses. This is the opposite of things like platonic ideals that say there's just these things that exist and we just have to figure them out. Sort of how Freud thought of the unconscious, like it's just there and we just have to figure it out. 
their intersubjectivists are saying, no, it's always being created between people. It reminds me also of the little bit that I've read about quantum physics that says nothing really exists. Absolutely, unless we observe it. They're just these waves of probabilities. And until someone comes in and observes, and there's an interaction between observer and observed, and this also goes back to ancient Vedic texts, we don't have anything created until that interaction happens. And I know I've gone on a lot of tangents to philosophy and Eastern mysticism, but it gives you a feeling, I hope, for the ideas of how this projective identification as something that can happen between people occurs. Now, to go back to the intersubjectivists, one of them, Thomas Ogden, in 1979, wrote a paper on projective identification. And what he proposed, and this really is where it becomes important, that projective identification is not just an unconscious fantasy, as Melanie Klein said, or a defense mechanism, a way of getting rid of bad feelings, but it's also a mode of communication and a way that we can empathize with one another. So that was a lot of historical and philosophical and academic ideas, but how can we use these ideas in everyday life? So let me go back to the story of the trainer and we can look at what she did to get things back on track. Now, the first thing that she did was acknowledge that she was having a feeling. She did this when she said, I am feeling so inadequate. And she was also feeling frustrated. Now, that sounds like an easy thing to do, but often we don't pay attention to our own feelings because they come out in other ways, like we might lose our temper with someone else. Or often a clue comes from the body itself. And we'll talk more about this in an upcoming episode on the body ego. But in this case, we might feel a knot in our stomach or a neck pain for no reason that we can think of or are aware of. And it is a clue that we are feeling anxious or frustrated or something else. And the second thing is to not judge yourself for having that negative feeling like this trainer who felt she was angry and frustrated and inadequate. And she didn't like feeling that way because she's a trainer and she's there to be enthusiastic and encouraging. And she didn't like feeling like an angry person who didn't like her client. But of course, this relates to testament number one, neutrality. We are not bad people for having bad feelings. We're just humans. And when we stop judging ourselves, we can actually hear more clearly what is going on. So then we named our feelings and we stopped judging ourselves for having them. Then we can ask, what does this tell me? And this is where the magic comes in. The feeling contains data. It's data about ourselves because we're having the feeling, but it's also about the other person. So when this trainer stopped judging her feeling of inadequacy, she realized that what she was feeling about herself was actually how her client felt about himself. And when she realized this, she stopped feeling defensive and bad, and she was actually able to understand on a deep level, more than if he had just explained it, what her client was feeling, what he needed from her that he couldn't say for himself. So what did she decide to do? She texted him back and asked to set up a meeting. Now, that was the last thing that she wanted to do when she was feeling inadequate and angry. But when she realized all of this, she was able to step outside from the feeling. And this is the observing ego. This is contacting our observing ego, which is also going to be the topic of an upcoming episode because it's so important. But it is what she was able to do by thinking about this feeling that she was having. She asked him about his life when they met and learned more about him. He was a guy in his 50s, successful, but he was single and he was feeling down about his appearance. He didn't just want to lose 10 pounds and get stronger. He wanted to feel attractive to women. And once this trainer was able to hear this, she could give him the encouragement that he needed. A couple months later, I saw her with her client and he had lost weight and he looked motivated and they were working out really well. 
So I want to tell you about another area of life where projective identification and the ideas of the intersubjectivists has been very important, and that is in the area of parenting, relationships between parents and children. Now, one of the groups that was influenced and grew out of the intersubjectivists were the group of researchers known as the Baby Watchers. That sounds like a kind of wise and powerful and a little bit scary priesthood like in a sci-fi movie like The Spacing Guild in Dune. But these were a group of researchers from Dan Stern and then following on Dan Stern's work, uh, Bibi and Lachman. And they looked at the interactions between mothers mostly, sometimes fathers, and infants down to the age of four months or even newborns. And they looked at the micro interactions between them. And we are lucky enough at Columbia to have Beatrice Beebe's lab there. And I've had the privilege of working with her. She's developed a system of coding, slowing down videos of mothers and infants and coding their reactions one-on-one. And it is almost like she has discovered the source of ESP. She can predict personality issues in an individual at the age of 18 from a two-minute video of that person at four months old. She has also been working on a project with mothers who were pregnant when their spouses were killed in 9-11, mothers who were at risk of transmitting trauma to their children in the 9-11 project. And these kids are now 16 years old, and she has shown some amazing data working with them preventatively. But anyway, I want to tell you about a particular case where the mother felt awareness of bad objects in her, and this helped her overcome a challenge in her parenting. So she was a person who was really having a conflicted relationship with her youngest daughter. She had two daughters. Her older daughter looked more like her husband, who was dark, and her daughter was more petite, whereas her youngest daughter looked more like her, had red hair and was fairer. She would yell at the girl and be angry with her, and the girl was developing episodes of depression, and it was very much a problem. But this woman had a hard time controlling herself, and even seeing how this behavior was affecting her child. Now, she had experienced verbal, emotional, and sometimes even physical abuse from her own mother, but she said she didn't think it was important. She said, I've gotten over it. I don't need to think about it anymore. I'm successful. It doesn't matter. And she was successful. But over the course of her thinking about this and her working on her relationship with her own daughter, she had a conversation with her uncle, her her mother's brother, who told her about a time when he found his sister, her mother, as a young child crying alone. And, And she knew that her mother had also been a victim of abuse by her grandmother. But this story from her uncle made her really see her mother as a little girl and be able to kind of empathize with her and think about her. But all of this was kind of unconscious until one time she was yelling at her daughter in the way that she always was and we were trying to work on. But in the middle of this episode, because of all this work, she realized that she was having a feeling towards her daughter the way her mother must have felt about her. She was aware of this projective identification that she had become her own mother, at least invaded by that intergenerational hatred. And she saw what she was doing to her child. She also saw herself in her child. And because of this sort of revelation in that moment, she was able to stop this pattern. And we know, well, we've been working with them, and several months later, several, maybe a year or so now, they're doing so much better. It looks like a different family. So what is the lesson here? This projective identification, which sounds like hocus pocus, actually happens in real life. And when we understand it, it can give us incredible power over impossible situations. 
Somebody said to me a little while ago, I have this thing happening where I feel like people are calling me on stuff that I feel about them. There's a woman at work who says I'm intimidating, but I think she's intimidating. And a friend says I'm belittling, but I think she is. That's projective identification happening. And when we can recognize it, it helps us understand what's going on. When we feel bad, it may not be our own bad feeling we are having. Remember what you do is to name your feeling first and don't judge yourself for having it. And then remember that these feelings are data. A yoga class that I went to a while ago, the teacher said, remember that things people make us feel say more about them than they do about us. Now that yoga teacher owes Melanie Klein and the intersubjectivists an enormous debt of gratitude. This is Dr. JKB signing off. Since we are exploring together, you make the journey all the richer by subscribing to the show on iTunes. And even better, if you also leave a rating, it helps others to find us. If you have a story about how the concept in this episode helped you figure out something in your life, send it in, please. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter at Psychonaut Show. Show notes are on the website, thepsychonautshow.com. And if you leave me a question, it may well be an inspiration for an upcoming episode. Until our next trip, judge nothing, question everything, and remember, there's always a reason. Bye for now. All the patient stories presented on The Psychonaut Show are created by me to illustrate an idea. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The Psychonaut Show was created and produced by yours truly, John Burton. Art and web design by Hunter Creative. Post-production and sound design by Julio Gonzalez of Zimmer Media. Zimmer Media can be found online at zimmer.co. That's X-I-M-E-R dot C-O.